Methyl iodide has almost no real-world applications, and it's mostly just used as a chemical building block. The structure of methyl iodide is quite simple, with a chemical formula of CH3I. The bond between the carbon and the iodide is not very strong, and in many situations, the iodide-carbon bond can be broken and replaced with something more stable like an oxygen-carbon, a carbon-carbon, or a nitrogen-carbon bond. I personally plan to use methyl iodide for the synthesis of caffeine, starting from malleic acid. Here's the overall scheme that I plan to follow, and I've highlighted in red the step where the methyl iodide comes into play. Other than caffeine though, I don't really have any immediate plans for it, so if you guys have any suggestions on how you'd like to see it be used, leave a comment and let me know. Here we're going to be making methyl iodide the classic way, from iodine, red phosphorus, and methanol. In terms of quantities, I used about 83.3 grams of iodine, 120 milliliters of methanol, and about 42.3 grams of red phosphorus. Red phosphorus is pretty valuable, so 42 grams seems like a lot, but you should be aware that most of it is recovered at the end of the reaction. These are the main reagents in the reaction, but in the workup, we also use 60 milliliters of saturated sodium chloride, a few crystals of sodium thiosulfate, and drying agent, and in our case, we used calcium chloride. The method that I'm using in this video is kind of a mixture of ChemPlayer's method and the one that I found on Arrowid, and I'll provide links to both of these in the description. To start things off, I poured in about 120 milliliters of methanol into a round bottom flask. Into the methanol, I then dumped in directly about 83.3 grams of iodine. The moment that it's added, it starts to dissolve in the methanol, and it very quickly becomes a nearly black color. The next thing that I do is I drop in a stir bar and I set up an ice bath. Once everything is stirring, I add in 42.3 grams of red phosphorus in small additions. The addition of the red phosphorus will initiate the reaction and the production of the methyl iodide, and this reaction is exothermic which means it releases heat. Methyl iodide has a boiling point of around 42 C, so if we add the red phosphorus too quickly or we don't cool it adequately, the temperature could go above 40 C and we could start boiling off the methyl iodide. Anyway, while we're adding all the red phosphorus, I think it's a good time to talk about the reaction that's taking place. When the red phosphorus is added to the mixture, the first reaction to take place is between the phosphorus and the iodine to form phosphorus triiodide. The phosphorus triiodide is extremely reactive and it immediately reacts with the methanol to produce our methyl iodide as well as phosphorus acid as a side product. Both of these reactions can be pretty easily simplified into one chemical equation and I've included that here as well. Once all the red phosphorus has been added, we let it stir for a little bit and we set up a simple distillation apparatus. So here's our simple distillation apparatus, and to heat things, we use a hot water bath, which is heated to around 70 C. To help the methyl iodide make it over and to prevent it from condensing on the walls of the round bottom flask, I just decided to insulate things with a little bit of aluminum foil. So just after heating it for a little bit, you can see we start to get drops forming on the thermometer, and shortly after, we get methyl iodide coming over into our receiving flask. When we look over at our receiving flask, we can see a very faintly yellow liquid coming over, and this is our methyl iodide, which is contaminated with a little bit of iodine. You'll notice that the receiving flask is well cooled with an ice bath, and this is to limit the evaporation of the methyl iodide, because it does have a pretty decently high vapor pressure. So we keep collecting the methyl iodide, which should pretty much all come over at around 42 C, and when the temperature starts to climb a little, we stop the distillation. When we look back at our distillation flask, we have a red colored methanol solution and a lot of red phosphorus at the bottom. This methyl iodide product that we collected is transferred to a separatory funnel. I then added about 60 milliliters of saturated sodium chloride solution, which had a small crystal of sodium thiosulfate also dissolved into it. You can see that once it's added, the yellow color of the methyl iodide very quickly disappears. A little bit of iodine is giving it the yellow color, and the sodium thiosulfate reacts with it to form colorless sodium iodide. I don't show it here, but I take the separator funnel off the stand, cap it, shake it thoroughly with frequent venting, and then place it back on the stand for the layers to separate. 
Methyl iodide is much more dense than water and more dense than saturated sodium chloride solution. So it's the bottom layer and this is the one we want to collect and retain. So our now colorless methyl iodide solution is drained into an Erlenmeyer flask. It's a little blindingly white and hard to see here, but what we're doing is we're adding calcium chloride to remove any methanol or water that might remain. You can see that before it's added, it was a little bit cloudy, but afterwards it quickly clears up. After letting it sit for a few minutes, we're ready to put our methyl iodide into storage. To store it, I put it into a nice Pyrex jar with some freshly polished copper at the bottom. It's really hard to see here, but the funnel that I'm using has a little bit of cotton in it to filter out the calcium chloride. Methyl iodide has a pretty big tendency to break down, especially when exposed to light, and the copper helps to prevent or limit this. You can see here that our fresh methyl iodide is nice and colorless, but when I use it in a future video in a month or two, it might take on a slight yellow or purple color due to the presence of iodine. Anyway, once everything's been added, I remove the funnel and I cap it nice and tightly. As I said before, it's sensitive to light and I didn't have a glass amber bottle, so the next best thing is to wrap it in aluminum foil. The yield in the end was around 70 grams, which represents a percent yield of about 71%, which to me is decent. If you recall from before, I mentioned that there's a lot of red phosphorus at the end of our distillation and we can actually recover this. To recover it, it's actually pretty simple, and all we need to do is just to filter it off. I used the glass fritted filter here so you guys can easily see what's going on, but be aware that this did kill my filter. Filtering things like carbon or red phosphorus through a glass fritted filter is a terrible idea, and you'll probably never be able to clean it properly. To completely clean out the flask and remove all of the red phosphorus, I simply just do a few water washings. Once all of the red phosphorus has been added to the filter, I pull a vacuum and try to get rid of as much of the liquid as possible. I wash the red phosphorus a few times with a small amount of dilute sodium thiosulfate solution to get rid of any iodine that might remain. I then wash it several times with water and a few times with methanol. For each washing, I use a metal scupula to make sure that all of the red phosphorus is thoroughly washed. After the final washing, I pull a vacuum on it to dry it up as much as possible, and then I dump it out onto a piece of paper. Right now the red phosphorus here is still a little bit wet, so I simply leave it out in air to dry and then I weigh it to see how much we recovered. In the end, the recovery of the red phosphorus was about 38 grams, which means that only about 5 grams of red phosphorus was lost in the reaction. This makes sense, and if we calculate how much red phosphorus we should have used based on how much methyl iodide we produced, it comes out to be around 5 grams. For now, that's all I really have to say about methyl iodide. Like I said before, I do plan to use it in the future to synthesize caffeine, but if you guys have any other cool ideas, feel free to leave a comment below. Anyway, as usual, I'd like to extend a big thanks to all of my supporters on Patreon, and especially those who donate $5 or more. Anyone who donates and supports me on Patreon gets to see my videos 24 hours before I release it to YouTube, and if you donate $5 or more, you get your name at the end of the video like you see here. In the next few months though, I want to work on my Patreon page a lot, and I want to get more rewards going, and maybe even get some higher tier ones, and I want to also offer some Patreon exclusive content. Also, as usual, here's the videos that I've currently filmed and the ones I plan to work on. If you have any suggestions or ideas, please feel free to leave them in the comments.